Good evening, everyone. So happy to see you all here. Um, so we got together, myself, I'm, I'm Rita Simmons, I'm a poet, and I got together with these other three poets and we chose a poem that we liked written by another famous poet uh, that we thought outlined the theme of the New York encounter. And then we also chose some of our own poems we talked about them, we worked on them, so I think that you're in for a real treat tonight. Um, so as you saw um, in, the, in the video of the New York Encounter theme, it outlines how in the face of the struggles of our time, we yearn more and more for genuine connections, and we look for someone who is not uncomfortable with our brokenness. <clears throat> so I, I would like to read to you um, a poem from, or I'd like to read you part of a poem by Les Murray called An Absolutely Ordinary Rainbow. There's a fellow crying in Martin Place. They can't stop him. The traffic in George Street is banked up for half a mile and drained of motion. The crowds are edgy with talk and more crowds come hurrying. Many run in the back streets, which minutes ago were busy main streets, pointing, there's a fellow weeping down there. No one can stop him. The man we surround, the man no one approaches, simply weeps and does not cover it. Weeps not like a child, not like the wind, like a man, and does not declaim it, nor beat his breast, nor even sob very loudly. Yet the dignity of his weeping holds us back from his space, the hollow he makes about him in the midday light in his pentagram of sorrow, and uniforms back in the crowd who tried to seize him, stare out at him, and feel with amazement their minds longing for tears as children for a rainbow. Some will say in the years to come, a halo or force stood around him. There is no such thing. Some will say they were shocked and would have stopped him but they will not have been there. The fiercest manhood, the toughest reserve, the slickest wit among us trembles with silence and burns with unexpected judgments of peace. Some in the concourse scream who thought themselves happy. Only the smallest children and such as look out of paradise come near him and sit at his feet with dogs and dusty pigeons. Ridiculous, says a man near me, and stops his mouth with his hands as if it uttered vomit. And I see a woman shining, stretch her hand and shake as she receives the gift of weeping. As many as follow her also receive it. And many weep for sheer acceptance and more refuse to weep for fear of all acceptance. But the weeping man, like the earth, requires nothing. The man who weeps ignores us and cries out of his writhen face and ordinary body, not words, but grief, not messages, but sorrow, hard as the earth, sheer, present as the sea. And when he stops, he simply walks between us, mopping his face with the dignity of one man who has wept and now has finished weeping. Evading believers, he hurries off down Pitt Street. Now I'd like to read a few poems that I've written and I see my friend Rick back there saying that he would only come if I would just very briefly give him a slight hint of uh, what the poem was about. So I said, okay, I will do that. But I have to do it, I have to do it quickly because uh, we're timed here. Okay, so um, the next poem that I wrote, it's, it's called Hope's Fool and is written about a very dear friend of mine whom some of you know, her name is Tiffany Gullah and she passed away in 2016 after having a very long illness um, which she got, it was called scleroderma and, and she got the illness when the Twin Towers came down and she got mercury poisoning and her, her system shut down. Uh, Tiffany was a big inspiration to all of us and uh, I wrote this poem for her. It's called Hope's Fools. I parked at the hydrant near her stoop and stood looking up at the door. 
the one I used to have the key to when her fingers were gone, her arms couldn't lift anymore. The disease took her toes too, but she was a dancer and knew how to move her weight around, which became less and less as decay took its course. She'd sit while I brushed her long blonde hair, opened jars and mail, tended her wounds. She'd thank me, Jesus, Mary, and all the angels with the same breathy voice. Tiffany, I said, I know you're not gone. I saw her face, as big as the house, the two windows, her eyes, the bars on the door, her teeth. When I turned to leave, a car came down the block. The driver slowed to speak to me. You can't park here, I said, certain he wanted my spot. Julissa, he said, holding his heart. I shook my head. He searched my face as his turned red. He smiled and apologized, but I was sorry too. Sorry that I wasn't Jalissa. Sorry that hope had played him for a fool. As he drove away, I turned toward the house to say goodbye. Hope collects fools all the time. The next poem I want to read read to you is called A Mantle for All Seasons. And um, if anybody knows what the, sea, the Feast of Candlemas is, it's, um, we just celebrated it on February 2nd, the, the Feast of the Presentation of Jesus in the Temple. And um, so this is a tr tr another true New York, New York story. My morning meditation is pierced by her presence. She stands shaking in the aisle holding her walker in the summer dress I had given her in July when she called for help near the stairs. I thought she had fallen. It seemed almost worse. An ambulance won't come for this type of distress. She begged me for a change of clothes. I ran home in the heat, carrying her shame like a mother would for her child's accident. I picked out a long cotton dress sleeveless with turquoise stripes. Nice and cool and pretty too, I thought. She wears it now in winter for the Feast of Candlemas. As she travels the periphery of the pews, shuffling her big, big brown boots, mumbling praise, a child is offered in the temple again. A mother's soul accepts both joy and pain. Okay, so the third poem is called Saint Fotina the Martyr. And I was very surprised to learn. So this is a poem about the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, um, who Jesus told her that she had five husbands and the one that she was with now was not her own. Um, and I was su surprised to learn that she was a saint and a, and a martyr, Saint Fotina. Depleted pale, seared soul, how I hated this round trip alone in the heat of midday as daily I needed to go to draw water from a common hole. Jacob's well, an abyss bittersweet with life's defilement and relief, a place of echoes, familiar and strange, like the weary man who rested there on sun-scorched stone, addressing me. Were we alone? He ordered me to give him drink, knowing I was not his kind. Unkind, he spoke my scorn, warring like the sun on one already worn, how could he know all I'd been through and the many who'd been through with me? I froze in heat, confused and drawn, my empty pail at his feet. Its echo cried the drought in me. This echo's cried for centuries. One word has turned the flow. Who is this man who fills and serves yet sits on Jacob's stone? He is the depth 
and brink of me. I'll run and spill and spill it all. Thank you. Sorry. I have to introduce the next speaker. James Davis May is a 2021 National Endowment of, for the Arts Fellow in Creative Writing and the author of, author of two poetry collections, On Quiet Things and Unusually Grand Ideas, which will be published this month. I think it's already published, right? This week. Yep. Um, so hot off the press, okay. He's originally from Pittsburgh, and he now lives in Macon, Georgia, where he directs the creative writing program at Mercer University, James Davis May. Thank you, Rita. Thank you so much for everything you do for poetry, too, at, at this conference. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a brilliant idea, too, because uh, poets are nervous people. Uh, particularly in front of large audiences. Usually it's about five people, so you're not looking at me. Uh, so I like this very much. Um, as uh, Rita said, I have a book uh, that's coming out uh, this week, actually, or it is out this week, and I thought I'd celebrate by, not, uh, by reading poems that aren't in it. Um, it's a book about uh, depression and grief and uh, doesn't really work with the theme as much, um, which we, we sort of gravitated towards uh, gratitude and thanks, and I, that was a nice, uh, it was refreshing after writing uh, this, this book. I'm gonna open with a poem uh, called Under the Vulture Tree. It's by uh, the, uh, David Bottoms, uh, so probably one of the, I don't know, top 50, or he's certainly one of the best Southern poets in the last 50 years. Um, he's also my dissertation director, so I have to say that too. Um, but he's a, a very dear friend, and um, um, this is his poem, Under the Vulture Tree. We have all seen them circling pastures, have looked up from the mouth of a barn, a pine clearing, the fences of our own backyards, and have stood amazed by the one slow wing beat, the endless dihedral drift. But I had never seen so many so close, hundreds, every limb of the dead oak feathered black. And I cut the engine, let the river grab the John boat and pull it toward the tree. The black leaves shined, the pink fruit blossomed red, ugly as a human heart. Then, as I passed under their dream, I saw for the first time its soft countenance, the raw fleshy jowls, wrinkled and generous, like the faces of the very old who have grown to empathize with everything. And I drifted away from them, slow, on the pool of the river, reluctant, looking back at their roost, calling them what I'd never called them, what they are, those dwarfed, transfiguring angels who flock to the side of the poisoned fox, the mud turtle crushed on the shoulder of the road, who pray over the leaf graves of the anonymous lost, with mercy enough to consume us all and give us wings. And so as I said, uh, David is my, uh, or was my dissertation director, I guess he always will be, um, but he was very kind to me when uh, there was a very sort of scary situation going on uh, with, with our unborn daughter, and uh, this poem is about that. Um, it's also sort of in reply to the previous poem. Um, it, there's a slightly bad word in here, so earmuffs if you're sensitive. So this is Vultures for David Bottoms. You say they have the faces of the very old, but David, they look more like skulls to me, and there's been enough death around here lately to send their numbers soaring. At least five patrol our neighborhood at a time, surfing the updrafts with what looks like glee and coiling the stringy carcasses of the squirrels who seem to aim themselves at our wheels. Of course, I thought of you, your memory of the dead oak tree overwhelmed with black feathers, when I saw the wooden fence that at a distance looked as though it had sprouted bulky shadows over each rail. I jogged closer, slowed down, and felt almost threatened as they eyed me readying their wings so their collective darkness swelled like a churning storm. And I remember how you took me aside once, years ago, another time I was scared. My unborn daughter was in danger of being born too soon, and still all anyone could say was that my life was over. Have fun now, they jeered. You never will again, but not you. 
It will all be good, you told me. There will be shit to do, and you'll do it, but it'll all be good. And it was. Then I got too close, and they lifted like a black breaker against a sharp shore, leaving the split rail fence, its zigzag going on and on, following the road like the writing we do as children before we know how to spell, before we even know the letters. The words just lines of scribbles, and we have nothing but faith that the ones who love us will know exactly what we mean. And so after completing uh, the book about depression and grief, I, I really did want to write some poems of gratitude. And I started a series of poems about um, what you might call a secular saints or, or, or small little personal miracles. And this poem is about um, a time uh, when, a very distressing time, when my daughter had uh, fainted, fallen backwards, kind of off of something like this and hit her head. Um, and uh, you need to know it's all okay now. She is texting, asking for money on her debit card, so it's all good. Um, she, she made it just fine, um, but it was a very scary moment, and this is sort of about the rush to get to the hospital. So this is called The Patron Saint of Traffic Lights. My child is in the back seat with her mother and can't understand what's happening keeps forgetting we've already told her that she fainted and hit her head hard on the living room stone floor, that we're going to the hospital that has a special doctor for kids, but everything will be all right. And though she doesn't believe our reassurances, knows even concussed that we would lie to calm her. She listens each time until we pause, and then she blinks and the awful loop repeats itself. What happened? Where are we going? But what's also happening is that all the lights are green and have been green for miles, each one ushering us on, some turning right before I'm about to break, some not needing to change, unblinking eyes watching us approach from far down the street, the same street I will drive on much later, when all will be well, when my daughter will know what happened and I will be late for a meeting or so hungry that just thinking will feel like anger, and the light will stop me. And as promised, I won't curse or hit the steering wheel. I won't even sigh, but instead look up and remember the small miracle I received when I needed it. And that pauses like these are also needed to revive my gratitude, which should be ongoing, steady, constant, without end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is the, so I, I will read one poem from my book. It's the last poem in the book. So it, uh, after going through some very tough moments, I hope it ends on a sort of happier note. So this is called A Field of Sunflowers. I don't want them to be anything but what they were. Not an audience of minor gods, not a skyline of spotlights, not a crowd of child-drawn faces or a battalion of showerheads not an anxious jury or a choir whose song was too perfect to perceive, not a cache of organic road signs, not the magnification of a bee's eye I remembered studying in high school biology, which is what they looked like before my own eyes could focus and see it was a group of things and not just one thing that surprised me as I turned the corner. Easily a thousand flowers crammed into less than half an acre and not a house or barn within a mile. Not just beauty then, but its excess, and no author in sight. All that meticulous design and care. Who would give such a gift without the pleasure of witnessing its acceptance? I thought about it a long time as I watched the flowers that nodded but did not answer. So, thank you. So uh, Eva Hustria, oh, I didn't do it right, I'm, I'm practicing my Polish, is a poet, translator, and educator. She has four books of poems in English, uh, The Ur's Purple Galanu, Of Annunciations, Contraband of Hopo, Strata, as well as three books in Polish. She has also translated various authors into Polish, including books by Jack London, Joseph Conrad, as well as a book of selected poems by Jory Graham, and selected poems of uh, Kazim Ali, Nicole Swenson, and other American poets. Please welcome Ava.
Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you, Rita, for organizing it. <clears throat> so I wanted to start with um, um, a poem called Refugee by an Irish poet named John Dean. Refugee. This, then, is the Christ. They named him Alan, Alan Kurdi. He is three years old, red t-shirt, short sleeved, navy blue shorts, shoes navy blue. He has been washed ashore. He lies face down on the wet shingles. He's helpless. He has been helpless all his life. He was obedient in everything. He was lifted aboard a crowded dinghy. He had few words. He is the word. In him all things were created, and in him all things hold together. <clears throat> and when I met uh, my mother-in-law, she already had Alzheimer's disease, and um, I want to read to you a poem that was actually ex an experience that happened to my husband um, when he met her. Uh, and not to spill a single grain. My mother welcomes me with half-empty sugar packets in her palms. She takes them for dollars. They perch like fledglings. The puffs of white grace awaiting their takeoff. Can I hold them? I ask and she slowly deposits them into my hands. Each grain of sugar carries a trajectory of longing. Like the centrifugal leaps of my mother's neurons make her grasp the inscape of things. One needs to be an oracle to hear an oracle. So during COVID, uh, I had sabbatical and I was stuck at home. I couldn't go to Poland. And a neighbor of ours, we live in New Hampshire, um, built us bluebird boxes. And bluebirds started to nest uh, every summer. And this is sort of uh, like every summer, this is a moment of transcendent reality for me. And it also made me think about strangely enough, fecundity and maternity, because I actually overlook and sometimes hold them in my palms or help them if they fall off the nest, fall from the nest. <clears throat> Consider a womb as a bird. One powder blue unfertilized egg and three blue nestlings. And we build a station of dreams. Fecundity, what is it? If she had a child, she would tell it, these nesting boxes are about luck and timing, although best when they just transpire, so we can proclaim a miracle and shun meticulous planning. But she tells an invisible child, carrying her down rivers, that to be the mother of all means to dwell in sorrow and evanescence. A mother and a virgin in one is our ideal. So we overcome gravity with tales. And these bluebirds, domesticated partially, reproduce in our hands. Hands of a mother are a cradle, and hands of a non-gravitational mother a boat. Ancient Greeks believed the uterus had suckers. Imagine it as an octopus or a cuttlefish. And that brings us to wetness. The nature of mother and the ocean are one. A womb, animal within animal, 
and because we are only to understand analogically, a womb is also a vessel, wine skin, a dove, Holy Spirit, fallopian tubes as wings. That's why shamans dress as birds to access the other world. What flatters. And um, <clears throat> next poem I wanted to read to you is about when my dad visited me. It was 10 years ago. I teach in a small college in New Hampshire. And I had to take him with me to a belly dancing workshop. <clears throat> and this is particularly meaningful because my dad recently started to have memory issues. He actually, last time um, I talked to him, claimed it was 1945. Acts of Exile. My 80-year-old dad visits from his native country. The Global Cafe Club I run at the college is having a belly dancing workshop. There is a table with some soda and chips for the workshop guests. The workshop begins and my father positioned himself in an armchair far in the corner with a bowl full of chips. It is the first time I am taking a belly dancing workshop. It is his first encounter with chips. The chips, a symbol of the rotten West, were inaccessible during the communist regime. After the regime collapsed, they were one of the most expensive imports on Polish shelves. I bent the knee to drop the hip and straightened the knee to lift the hip again and again. My dad, in his corner, lifts each chip to his mouth and crunches over and over. Not unlike a burlesque show, we each indulge in the forbidden. <laughs> the belly dancing coach says, imagine you have your arms full of groceries and you push the car door shut with your hip. I recall my dad getting lost years ago, his first time in an American supermarket. I imagine him hiding there until they close the shop, wandering between the aisles and snacking from every possible shelf. Now he's my only child in the corner of the room, an empty bowl in his hands. Later that day, he will tell me he's not hungry and won't have dinner. <laughs> the closer you are to the ground, the easier it will be for you to find the balance, the coach says how we both try. And the last poem I want to read is from the book uh, Yours Purple Galinol. I meant to tell you that Galinol and Hrustel, my name, are related. Um, and this is the book in which I diagnose birds with mental illnesses. So I studied both DSM-5 and bird species. So these are the poems that if you buy the book, um, you'll know what illness I suffer from because birds finally get annoyed and diagnose me. <coughs> so I'm just going to read a poem about my teaching experience. I've taught at Colby Sawyer for 16 years. And at, at first, at the beginning, students would sometimes mishear uh, what I would say. And so this is a, a, um, a poem in which I describe teaching Elizabeth Bishop's moose. And in that poem, it's a very long poem, people are on the bus and there is a moment when the moose comes out of the woods and he's huge. And it's like a moment of you know, transcendence and revelation and much struck in the dark. Uh, so this is, um, this is the poem. <clears throat> the poet reads aloud Bishop's moose to her students. I trot line by line, showing my students leaps in space and time. Poetry is an arctic fox, I tell them, leaping in the air to catch his prey. Each of his muscles are astute. Fox eats like a saint. When I get to the bus's sudden jolt, as the moose comes out of impenetrable woods, towering, underless, high as a church, homely as a house. I want them to be there, to get a match struck in the dark. 
but all my students here from my Eastern European accent is mouse. <laughs> What's the big deal? Why stop the bus, they whisper. And the mouse as big as a church? They wonder at my love of poetry, my silly enthusiasm. And I think of all my life ambitions as big as Caucasus mountains to me, mounts to others. And how I want to rise in the middle of the road, like a cathedral, stop passers-by. But all they see is a small mouse nervously building her nests in foreign walls. Thank you. <clears throat> And our next reader is Ned Balvo. Uh, his six books include award-winning The Selborne Touch Me Nots and Three Nights of the Perseids, both published in 2019. He received the 2019 New York Encounter Poetry Prize and is married to poet and essayist Jane Scatterfield. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, and Rita, thank you so much for arranging this and to my fellow panelists for putting up with me in our Zoom meetings, uh, which was a, a really a rollicking time and lots of fun uh, for, for me. <laughs> I hope so for them, too, when, even though I took part. Um, I'm first going to read a poem by Louise Bogan, which is one of my favorite poems. She was the fourth uh, a poet, poetry cons uh, Fourth, a consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress, which we now know as Poet Laureate, first woman to hold the title, and a pretty renowned uh, critic and a uh, distinguished uh, author. Night by Louise Bogan. The cold, remote islands and the blue estuaries, where what breathes, breathes the restless wind of the inlets, and what drinks, drinks the incoming tide, where shell and weed wait upon the salt wash of the sea, and the clear nights of stars swing their lights westward to set behind the land, where the pulse clinging to the rocks renews itself forever, where again on cloudless nights the water reflects the firmament's partial setting. Oh, remember in your narrowing dark hours that more things move and blood in the heart. I love this poem for its austere beauty and the way it captures a God's eye view of the world, a view that is detached, inclusive, yet suffused with a certain tenderness and a strong awareness of the eternal. The tide renews itself forever. The water reflects the firmament's partial setting. The reminder at the end, remember that more things move than blood in the heart grants life to the world itself. All these forces surge and move, the sea, the Earth's orbit, the wind and the inlets, as if they are alive with their own life-giving pulse. Since this year's theme is, who am I that you care for me, and the word in a broken world is our panel's focus, I thought I'd say a few words about the need to care for the Earth itself, a world not irretrievably broken, we hope, and a few words, too, about those non-human denizens without whom the world wouldn't be the world we know, but something, someplace else. The world we do know, however altered, even damaged by time and humankind, is the same creation that the God of Genesis instructed Adam to care for. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The world, then, is not ours, but one on whose behalf we act or ought to act as stewards holding it in trust for future generations. It seems especially fitting to start out with one of my favorite poems by a poet of whom Tom Simmons speaks in the Christian Science Monitor as refusing, quote, to sacrifice personal questing and conscience to the easy comfort of unchallenging philosophies or theologies. Among these, according to Simmons, those dogmas related to divinity. One of Louise Bogan's greatest strengths is her exaltation of humility in the face of beauty, a model to which I aspire. 
Um, turning to my own poem, Ghost Owl, uh, this is about an actual experience. Uh, Jane and I were wandering around a university campus late at night in Colorado, uh, and there was a ghost owl or barn owl, that's just another term uh, for it. And uh, I was saddened to discover, as I uh, flipped through the Bible after writing the poem and in preparation for this, uh, 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 this panel, uh, to find that you know, owls are really not particularly um, well treated in the Bible. Um, uh, for my days vanish like smoke, my bones burn like glowing embers, I am like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins, is in Psalms, I discovered. And uh, my ghost owl is a little different, an avian avatar indifferent to human curiosity, carrying out its genetic agenda, perfectly suited and driven by its bodily design and environmental niche. It cares not for all of us, but we should care for it, if only by valuing its place in creation. Uh, a version of this uh, appeared in Christian Century, but I've changed it a lot since then, so if you look it up online, you'll find that it's a different poem. Ghost Owl, Gunnison, Colorado. Ghost Owl, heart-faced, a tiny planet high up on a fir branch caught in cell phone light. You're like a secret, guarded, out of reach. We orbit round your whitewashed trunk, earthbound, unmoved above, equivocal. You meet our gaze, but make no sound. Let time play out auspiciously, whether you vanish noiselessly or navigating past a steeple, find some other darkness, trouble forecast as in flight, you listen close to ground. The night is quiet. The spark of eyes, a single talon shines. Outlasted on our chase, we'll leave you far up, fixed in place, miraculously possible, eyes closing in a heart-shaped face. The bees, in contrast, are actually a very uh, popular in the Bible. They make honey, and for that reason, they're models for monastic cooperation in industry, as well as conscientious laborers whose efforts yield pleasure, nourishment, and joy, even if we have to get stung every so often. Uh, Proverbs tells us, honey from the comb is sweet to our taste, and of course, references to honey are everywhere. Just look it up on the internet if you're not actually flipping through a physical Bible. There's the land of milk and hum honey, and in the Song of Solomon, thy lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb, honey and milk are under thy tongue. Thank you, Jane. That's for you, that line. <laughs> it's, it's still Valentine's Day week. <clears throat> in my poem, Memory in the Hive, the need for beekeepers to treat bees as family members during periods of mourning reflects not only folk belief, but also a deeper understanding that the living world cares for us and must be cared for in return. Enjoyment of its riches must be kept in balance with our nurturing of its resources. A nurturing that includes refraining from any actions that threaten those species upon whom we depend, as well as all the rest whose survival we must protect. Intelligent past our understanding, they follow their own determined course. The privilege of sharing our world with them should be exercised with humility and a commitment to making it less broken. Memory and the Hive. Telling the bees, and some of you, of course, may have run across this folk belief in recent stories about the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, I found in looking up things, uh, having run across that, that this is actually a, uh, an old and, 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 and uh, uh, very deeply rooted tradition in many cultures and many nations. So that was an interesting discovery. So not specifically thinking of anything royal here other than the queen bee. Memory in the hive. The hive after a death does not go silent. The cycle of its labors never ends. And yet we tell the bees a morning cloth laid on the hive, its darkness not so dark that light's extinguished, nor our human grief so deep that it resists all consolation. Heads bowed, our voices low, we break the news as if our grim misfortune is their own. By now, they've learned to recognize our faces, hazed by netting, gloved hands reaching through. What do they hear exactly when we speak? Our voices boom far off like harmless thunder. Each has her place, relentless foragers who hunt for nectar sun up to sundown, the gravid queen who checks each hexagon for larvae deep in metamorphosis, nurse bees who serve and feed them as they grow, the mortuary bees, who clear the dead. 
What have we told them that they didn't know? The hum gets louder. Soon they settle down, the gift of gathered nectar, bee to bee, reduced to honey as it's passed along, nourishes all. The fanning of small wings inside the hive is delicate, angelic. Such diligence brings solace. But in the dark, the hive's hum soothing, some skilled forager will seize the stage, the sun still on her mind, to share the best route to her choicest troves, conveyed by dance moves and the slant of light she mimics in the waggles of her steps. Is there a dance to signify the sad news of our human world? The morning cloth laid on the hive is not so dark as night when flowers shimmer brightly in the minds of bees who dance, remembering their travels, the gift of gathered memory, bee to bee. I'm going to end with a very short poem, and this is uh, in Shenandoah not too long ago, easy to Google, and uh, it is a uh, about, uh, well, I think you can see from the screen, a creature long viewed through the lens of metaphor and wonder. Uh, and thanks again, uh, Rita, for putting this together and to the New York Encounter folks for having us. Firefly or lightning bug? It doesn't matter which side of the debate you're on. It's okay. You can take either side. Firefly or lightning bug? If you are indeed a fly of fire, impossibly incandescent yet alive, why don't high branches, kindled, turn to flame when you alight? But if instead it's lightning that you hold, pulsing inside yourself, impatient glow some catalyst's arrival will ignite, why don't you strike? Perhaps it's fire and lightning you contain, those summer nights when set loose after rain, you flash among the dark trees passing by, winged star that flies. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much to our poets, uh, Ned, Ava, Jim. And before I read the last poem of the evening here, um, I just want to let you know that our books are on sale downstairs at the uh, Human Adventure book table. So if you want to go and buy a book and have one of us sign the book for you, then we'll be down there immediately, immediately following the event. So um, we have another event right on our tail. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this last poem, which I've kind of changed the title of to Name Four Friends. And I think of us as four friends. The poet should be the friend of all of humanity. And um, this is kind of um, my understanding of the gospel passage where the paralytic man was carried to the rooftop and then his four friends helped to carry him, to get him where he needed to go. So name four friends who would carry your bed were paralyzed from soul to head. You lie with pangs and scars outstretched. Name four friends who would plan and plot to land you near the sacred spot, the healer's hand, the feet of God. Name four friends who would brave the crowd that surrounds the space when the word is out to raise your ruins above the house. Name four friends who would crack the thatch, then ease your limbs into the gap and slow the lift, your lowered mat. Name four friends who would hold the line from the open roof to the master's side, where you lie and wait for a healing sign. Name four friends who would fix their gaze on the man who cures and the man who's saved. While the crowds disperse, the friendship stays. Name four friends who are still amazed. Thank you. Thank you.